Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, live lesson of our training in fine tuning LLMs course. Uh, my name is Darek Kwecek. Um, I'm a machine learning engineer at Weights and Biases, uh, calling in from Warsaw in Poland. Uh, we'd love to, uh, to learn where you're calling from. Um, if you can say something about you in the chat um, on our events platform, or uh, if you're watching us on the YouTube live stream, uh, that would be very helpful. I'm super excited to be joined uh, here on the stage um, by fantastic speakers. Uh, we have Weiwei Yang from Microsoft and Mark Sarufim from Meta, uh, who are uh, co-hosts of uh, Nurib's LLM Efficiency Challenge. And they will tell mo us more about this challenge uh, today. Super excited to learn more about this. I think this will be very relevant for all of you that are interested in uh, fine-tuning LLMs. And we're also joined by Ayush Thakur, um, a machine learning engineer at Weights and Biases. And Ayush uh, will give you like a very practical, hands-on uh, help to get started on this competition, including a starter package um, with, uh, with the code to get started. So also excited about that. So at the end of this lesson, you should be able to get started fine-tuning your models, which I think is, uh, is a good start of this, of this course. So um, why are we excited about training and fine tuning LLMs? At Weights and Biases, we work with, well, multiple customers. And, and this is one of the top questions that is, is always coming up. Everyone seems to be interested in LLMs. People are asking, how do we train? Uh, how do we fine tune these models efficiently? And uh, this um, experience that we have is also backed by data. Uh, what you can see on this chart is the number of uh, archive papers that contain a large language model keyword. And you can see it's growing exponentially. And given this exponential growth, like that can mean two things. Either it's a, it's a bubble or it's actually like a, a, a groundbreaking technology that is making a lot of new use cases possible. And um, my, personal, uh, my personal assessment based on my experience is, is it's, this is the latter. We can see um, a, a lot of new applications being enabled by this technology. Myself, personally, I've been using LLMs to assist me with writing, to assist me with coding, to edit uh, articles that I write. Uh, I've used LLMs to extract structured data from unstructured documents, a task that would take me weeks uh, before this technology became available. And now it's something that we can do in a couple of hours. Um, we've been using this for education. Uh, I've recently heard one of the people uh, that is behind some of the, the popular fine-tuned LLMs, the open source LLMs, has learned how to do it from GPT-4, which I think is, is, is a huge evidence that this, these tools are also helpful in education. At Weights and Biases, we've been using LLMs to help with customer support. Uh, we have a bot uh, on our Discord server that helps users uh, solve some of the technical problems they might be facing when it comes to Weights and Biases. We've been using it to um, automate translation of our docs to different languages, making the product also more accessible um, internationally. So this uh, set of applications makes, um, makes this feel really exciting. And that brings a lot of people into this field. And, um, um, and um, however, this, this field is not entirely new. Like for, for, for those of you that have been in machine learning, specifically in NLP, uh, you know, we've had language models um, applied effectively to solve different use cases for a couple of years. Started a couple of years ago uh, with ULM fit um, that, uh, that achieved uh, state-of-the-art results uh, on um, sentiment classifications on IMDB. And then uh, we had a huge explosion of, um, of encoder models and, and specifically transformers with BERT that, um, that, uh, that started to solve a lot of different NLP tasks very successfully. But the focus of this course is going to be on the right hand side of this, of this evolution tree of, of LLMs. And that these are the decoder only models, um, the, the autoregressive language models that are trained to predict the next word in a sequence, which started with the GPT family. Uh, they became like really, uh, really powerful. Uh, we started scaling them. We've seen success of chat GPT, GPT-4, and more recently, uh, a lot of other commercial models, uh, including uh, Palm and Bart and Claude, uh, Cohere command, as well as open source models. Uh, we're all super excited about, uh, about Llama, uh, but also other open source models like Bloom or OPT. Uh, they make a lot of use cases possible. 
and this is gonna this is gonna be our focus. Uh, this is where we see a lot of uh, benefits from the scale. This model are uh, um, are able to solve a lot of tasks in a in a very uh, general way. So, um, given this this popularity and given this power and the number of applications of large language models, a lot of you might want to get started with LLMs. And probably the best way to get started with LLMs is by using them via APIs. And you might be familiar with the open AIs provided by, uh, provided by um, open AI, uh, provided by Anthropic, provided by Cohere. Uh, in fact, uh, we recently released a course that, um, that teaches you to use these APIs to solve different uh, business problems and to automate uh, different tasks. So this course might be a good entry point into the world of, of LLMs. The benefits of using LLMs through APIs is it's easy to get started. You don't need to, 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 to do any or, or much of an upfront, upfront investment, either in training, in compute, in data, in capability. You can access really well-performing uh, large language models very quickly. On the, on the negative side, and the, 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 whenever you get into production and you get a large volume of, of requests in production, your inference cost may be substantial. So you need to prepare for that. Uh, you may need to share data externally. And for some use cases, for some uh, organizations, that may, be, uh, that may be something they'd rather avoid. You're also relying on external technology and sometimes uh, different companies um, Different companies may uh, may want to avoid uh, may want to uh, may want to avoid that. Let me take a quick break. I think um, we have a question to share uh, the slides uh, in the chat. I'm gonna try to quickly find the slides link and share it. Um, and I'm going to fix this and come back to the presentation. Okay, I apologize for that. The link to the slides will be shared in the uh, in the YouTube uh, live stream, the chat. Um, yeah, so we we talked about the we talked about the cons, like the negative aspects of using LLMs through an API. Another one is um, is is lack of flexibility. For example, in many use cases, you may want to implement inference on the edge, and again, that may be hard if you're using this uh, LLMs behind APIs. So if those negatives like outweigh the, the positives of, of LLMs, uh, you may want to get into this uh, second part uh, of, the, of the solutioning, which is either fine tuning an open, source, open sourced LLM or pre-training your own LLM. When do you want to fine tune? Uh, if you want to benefit from this external investment that is done by companies that release uh, these uh, open source LLMs, um, if you want to take control over the roadmap, if you want to own model weights, uh, that uh, that may give you some some control over the over the future of your of the products that you're building on top of LLMs. Um, it becomes more difficult. You need to get the right skills. You need to get like do the right investment, and hopefully this course will provide you with some of the skills that are needed to fine tune fine tune or train your own LLMs. Uh, Pre training LLMs is even more expensive than fine tuning, but there are many use cases where it might be the right choice. You may want to do it for competitive advantage. You may want to have like full control over your roadmap, over the future direction, over the training data, but you need to be ready to significantly invest in terms of the talent, in terms of compute resources, and um, and, and also be prepared to, to face some risks because uh, this is not always easy. So what are the types of, of fine tuning? Um, the first type of fine tuning I want to talk about is, is fine tuning for specific tasks. And uh, given that we are mainly focusing on autoregressive language models, which are trained to predict the next word in a sequence, if you train a base uh, language model, they will, they will simply learn to, to, to continue a given text, but we may want to, to, to fine tune them, to teach them to uh, to, to, to solve specific tasks. And that thing we can achieve via fine tuning. One example of this is uh, the T5 model that, was trained, like, where, that uh, was trained to solve different tasks. 
in a in a when when where the task is defined as some sort of text, and then the answer is a solution to this task. I think some of the tasks that are that are going to be used uh, for the evaluation of the challenge that we will talk later today may be framed in this way. So it's a good idea to look at this uh, different type of tasks that uh, and the way of of phrasing them in text um, and a, a different way of of using prompts to to then um, uh, to then uh, guide the model to solve to solve specific tasks. Um, this can be made very specific. This can be made specific for your application, but there are also more general ways of fine tuning uh, language models. And they have been really made popular by, by OpenAI, starting with the instruction tuning uh, approach and then um, instruction tuning um, uh, in, in the instruction tuning approach, we teach a model to follow instructions. We may not necessarily want it to continue the text that we start with, we may prefer it to give it some instruction and then get a response uh, that follows that instruction in return. And the first step to achieve it is supervised fine tuning. We provide a model with a set of instructions and responses and then uh, train a model to, um, to behave in a similar way. Uh, another step that is often used on top of instruction fine tuning uh, and the supervised step uh, is reinforcement learning from human feedback. And that, uh, in turn, like also uh, consists of two steps. One step is training a reward model, where the uh, where we teach a model like what humans like what humans prefer, and then we use that reward model to train uh, to 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 fine tune our language model via reinforcement learning to be aligned uh, with human preferences. And we'll do a, a big uh, we'll do a more deep dive into this um, into these techniques in in later parts of this of this course. Um, one thing that is um, one thing that I want to share is also like this boundary between pre-training and fine-tuning is not is not always clear. Uh, we don't know much about uh, GPT-4 or ChatGPT, but the one thing that was uh, that was shared by OpenAI is actually these models were trained over a series of steps. Uh, uh, ChatGPT started as a code model. It was trained uh, to it was trained on on code to help with with programming, and then it was further fine-tuned uh, first to follow instructions. Then it was um, aligned uh, with human preferences using RLHF. Uh, it was then further fine-tuned chat data, and uh, all of the steps like resulted in in GPT 3.5, which actually I think since uh, uh, since very recently we can also fine-tune. So uh, depending on like which step, uh, which which type of checkpoint you're using, you might be actually fine-tuning a model that already uh, had been fine-tuned for a for a different task. Now, if you want to learn uh, how to do this, uh, I think the best way to do it is by is by starting to build. To build, and uh, especially with the release of some of the very powerful open source language models like Llama from Meta, that we uh, were very thankful for, like we see a lot of activity. A lot of people take these models, um, use different types of data sets uh, to fine tune uh, these open source uh, uh, open source language models. They fine tune it on different languages. They fine tune it on different tasks. Some of them use synthetic data, and um, this is a process that actually like has become possible very recently. And hopefully, in this course, we'll also show you how you can do this. And actually, for this fine tuning stage, you don't need that much uh, that much compute, and it, this this has really become accessible to a broader range of audience. But you do need uh, several things, and this is something that we'll be focusing on in this course. Um, the first step that we recommend to start with is, is trying to figure out what is your goal for fine tuning. And to do this, um, like you need to figure out the evaluation. How, how will you tell that your model is actually progressing and is learning, is improving? For that, you need to de decide on an evaluation approach. We'll talk more about evaluation uh, next week. Um, I think the, the team um, today will also talk about how how they're going to be evaluating solutions in the in the LLM efficiency challenge. Um, we will not go into the in depth on the model architecture choices. Uh, that is probably a topic for a different course. But once you understand your evaluation, once you understand your business goals and the metrics, you might check different benchmarks, different leaderboards that are available, and pick a foundation model that is suitable for your task. So hopefully understanding evaluation will also help you pick the right uh, foundation model that you may want to fine tune. And then once, you, once you've done, done it, like the hard part is figuring out the right data mix uh, to fine tune your model on, and then using efficient training and fine tuning techniques. 
And this keyword of efficiency, especially important because we're dealing with very large models and um, we need to use the right techniques of, uh, to, to, to make them fit um, on, a, on a GPU and, and train efficiently. And I am uh, super excited uh, that we're partnering with Mosaic ML and specifically Jonathan Frankel, who is chief scientist at Mosaic ML and who will, uh, who will pro, uh, who will um, who has developed the lessons on data and on uh, efficient training techniques uh, of large language models, and this will be the two out of out of the four lessons in this course. So I'm personally excited to be learning from Jonathan. Mosaic ML is uh, training and fine tuning LLMs as a business that's uh, and they have huge expertise in this top in this in this field, and uh, I'm sure everyone uh, can benefit uh, from this uh, from these lessons. Um, Okay, we have a question uh, from the chat. Uh, the question is what kind of architecture uh, will be used uh, in the course? And um, actually we are not prescribing the architecture. I think uh, actually in the, in the la later part today, Ayush will uh, provide a comparison of two different architectures, uh, two different foundation models that he uh, used for this task. But we will be focusing primarily on this generative uh, on, of the, on the autoregressive uh, decoder-only language models. That's, um, that's uh, an area that is currently being explored. That's uh, the area that is, I would say, scaling more, most rapidly into larger sizes. And we also feel like some of the, some of the, the older language models uh, that had like the decoder-only architecture like BERT, uh, the BERTA, like the, um, the community already knows how to fine tune them. Uh, there are good frameworks like Hugging Face, um, Python's Lightning, so we feel like there is there is a less demand for knowledge on the encoder models than on the decoder only models. Okay, so um, I think we'll come back to questions uh, later on, but I want to make sure we hand over to the to the uh, to the hosts of Nurib's LLM Efficiency Challenge, and uh, I'd like to to now hand over to uh, Weiwei uh, Yang uh, and uh, Mark Sarufim. Uh, who are uh, co-hosting, organizing this challenge. The reason we are excited about this is we believe the best way to learn is by actually doing, by building. And this uh, challenge provides a way to do it in a ac very accessible way because they set the constraints that make it available to a broad range of, of engineers. So over to, to you, Weiwei. Um, thank you very much, Derek, for that introduction. And uh, maybe if you stop sharing, I can share my presentation. Um, Hi, can everyone see my presentation or maybe to the extent uh, there's the folks in the room. So thank you very much for having us and we're very, very excited to come here and to talk about our uh, competition. And uh, as uh, Derek put out that um, all the needs talked about, all the needs to fine tuning, what it comes down to is that uh, as powerful as all these uh, lang large language models are, pretty much no model will satisfy everything that you need to do 100% of the time. So you will need to do some adaptations, whether it's because of your privacy security concerns or because you have other type of data and modalities that you want to get into like and use the power of this large language model. So we conceptualized this competition partially because of this need to fine tune and also because this very few resources out there to teach the community how to fine tune from model selections to all the steps and the well documented and so we're hoping to use this to not only create a, a sort of step by step ways of how to approach this but also make it reproducible so for part of this competition as organizers we are um, we actually signed up to verify the winning submissions to make sure that uh, we could produce the same results. So just a little bit about the competition. Um, this is kind of like the rules. We limit the competition to run on just one single GPU. The reason is that uh, these large language models will use up any resources you're willing to put into it. So we have to put some constraints and also with one single GPU make it more practical for most folks' applications. We also limit the time to one day. So 
all the fine tunes has to be done with that one GPU within the day. And we have two tracks. One is A100 with 40 gigs of RAM. This is uh, maybe one of the most popular machine learning hardware out there. And uh, most of these uh, um, uh, most of these uh, large language models are fine tuned on a uh, trained on a cluster of these uh, A100s. And uh, then the 4090 is very popular with gamers and now has uh, gained a lot of popular uh, with uh, machine learning communities. It uh, has less um, RAM, but it is still workable. We also have a set of pre-selected models to choose from. The reason that uh, we um, go with a list of a pre-approved model is because uh, we want the communities to have a good starting point and they can't uh, reproduce every step as uh, the winning entry. And uh, Sebastian from Lightning AI had helpfully mapped out uh, the collection of models that we choose and some of them are encoder models as mentioned that encoder models randomly mask a percentage of the text and you're trying to predict what's masked so it's bi-directional and uh, um, for tasks like classification sentiment analysis those are like the models that tend to perform really well on the other side we have the decoder models which predicts the next token so for text generation type of things and uh, as we know llama and the chat gpt based on that, then you have encoder decoder, which has an encoder and the decoder stuck together. So the original attention zone you need, this is like the original like model architecture and it's a sequence to sequence. So it's good for machine translation type of tasks and also summarization or question and answer. Um, so um, what models you choose is, uh, what base model you choose is um, heavily dependent on what task you need to do, but uh, also we're hoping through this uh, competition, people will explore like uh, all these models uh, and we're curious uh, which one of them will win out. Um, we allow like most of the data set with a few caveats specifically, we do not allow LLM generated uh, data set. Mark and I have, um, to, uh, are happy to talk more about it in the question answer phase, why we put that rules in. And we also wanted the data to be open sourced uh, at the time of the mission. Again, this is uh, done with the hope to be reproducible so that uh, everyone else can use this data set. So on the right side, here's a few examples of the data that uh, um, you can use. Um, so for evaluations, uh, we decided to choose uh, this framework called HELM. Um, HELM is uh, um, a comprehensive benchmark uh, that's put out uh, by Stanford. Uh, one of the problems uh, today with uh, this large language model is uh, actually how do you evaluate it? So if, for example, you go to Harding Faces uh, model leaderboard, uh, you get a score and you have uh, four tasks. But what does it really mean that it has like 87% uh, on truth for QA. It uh, okay, maybe means that uh, it uh, answered 85% of uh, the evaluation task correctly, but uh, what about robustness if you just permute some of the tokens? So if it answers truthfully, is Earth flat? No, but uh, what if you permute the tokens? Say if a white male says Earth is flat, would the large language model decide to answer that yes? So those are the type of things that are very few. Uh, there are very few studies out there, and in order to really understand about how your language how your language model will perform in the task and also perform properly, we need to take a more comprehensive view about the evaluations. So accuracy is the one aspect that people have looked into, but we also decided to look into calibration, robustness, fairness, bias, toxicity, and efficiency. So those are the metrics that's already well defined in Helm benchmark. For those who are interested, you can go visit the website. The stack will be shared out with all the appropriate links. Um, Specifically, like uh, for the open evaluation uh, phase, uh, we have uh, choose a few scenarios or tasks, and uh, these are actually very well known machine learning tasks. So, like Big Bench, multiple um, a choice, a choose for QA, like uh, CNN Daily Mail summarization, Great School Mass, and the uh, Barbecue Plate Set. We also reserved a class, a closed data set that uh, we have not told the community what we're going to evaluate on. The reason to do this is, of course, we approve. 
venting like winning entry to be a simple memorization. We don't think that's going to be happening, but uh, still, it's good to set something aside. Uh, the closed data set uh, will be very similar to the open uh, data set uh, with the same type of tasks, and we will announce those after the submission is closed. Uh, um, because we have two hardware tracks, uh, we actually like uh, have uh, um, two tracks of awards as well. So for each of the hard uh, hardware category, we have a first prize winner of $5,000, second prize $2,500, and the third prize $1,000 with two special like uh, student uh, prize for the team that's uh, like uh, outside of the three top prizes that uh, um, consists of a purely student teams. So like the next two team, uh, two pure student team that uh, scores the highest. And uh, for the first prize, a, pl a place winners, uh, um, we invite them to have a speaking chance at our in-person uh, in Europe workshop in December 2023 and a chance to co-author this uh, report out the paper that we're going to write about uh, this competition in the next Europe. <laughs> So I guess now I talked about uh, the structures of the competition, I'm just going to touch a little bit on the components that will take in order to make a success of entry. So first of all, we are putting a large language model into one GPU. Simply, most large language model you download today will have trouble fitting that. Why? If you think about it, uh, um, if you have one parameters and you represent it as a 32-bit float uh, or like four bytes, uh, um, if you have uh, a billion of those parameters, uh, that's four gigabytes, and that's just for weights alone. Now, you, if you need to fine tune you or training, you have other things. So, at eight bits per parameter, for example, for your atom optimizer, four bits for like gradient, and up to eight bits for like activations and temporary memories, it really adds up. So how do you actually make this fit? So this is like a technique called quantization. And uh, the simplest way you can approach it is just lop up some of the positions. So you can go like uh, instead of 32, you can do 16 bit, or you can go even further to 8 bit, or use some uh, like uh, interesting, like uh, uh, more nuanced uh, floating point representation. So for example, Google's like B float 16, which like changes the number of bits for mantissa and exponent as supposed to the standard IEEE. So these are some of the ways and there's many, many other ways that you could explore. And this is just a kind of teaser on quantization. Then the next thing is, uh, okay, I have my model in my, uh, in my hardware. How do I actually tune it? Uh, if I have uh, 70 billion parameters, do I really need to change all that 70 billion parameters uh, to make it uh, performant? Uh, so this whole category of what we call parameter efficient fine tuning, um, you can think about uh, essentially how to tune as little weight as possible to get it as performant as possible. You could uh, selectively freeze certain layers in your network, uh, or you could uh, adapt to several techniques. Uh, one of uh, the popular technique is actually prompt based, which is similar to like prompt engineering. You can think about prompt engineering as hard prompting, where you change the tokens uh, in your prompt. This is a more soft prompting technique uh, where you argument or you add extra things to your existing tokens to make it performant. So for example, prompt tunings, you add trainable parameters after each prompt and you train those parameters in the input representation layer. Um, prefix tuning is another way that you add these like a prefix in each layer of your model and you train that with a separate forward network. Um, P tuning is related to like a prefix tuning, except instead of putting in the beginning of each layer, you can like uh, have that interfix uh, into like any part of it and uh, use like uh, uh, sort of a more LSTM based uh, in 
encoders uh, to like uh, do your trick, um, um, do your prompt tunings and have other specialized tokens. So this is the one category. And uh, for those who are interested, uh, there's reference associated with each of these techniques. Uh, and the hugging face uh, actually include, I believe, all three of these techniques in their like um, in their para, in their like uh, library as well. The next category is adapter, and uh, adapter is uh, similar to um, prompt tuning. Instead of like just tuning the prompt, you actually add adapt layers uh, into um, exist uh, into standard transformer architectures. So you could uh, see it here, like uh, for example, adapt two adapt layers are now added uh, be, um, between the forward and the layer norms. Uh, um, the next popular technique is lower or low rank approximations. You can think about the fine tuning as uh, iteratively update your weight. So if you have a W, that's your weight matrix for your model, then you can think about fine tuning is keeping the original W matrix and then adding a delta W and that's the change of your weight. So fine tuning is just really the delta W that's added to the original weight. So now you can also decompose your delta W using like uh, matrix factorizations um, into like uh, two, maybe a tall scale and the short fat matrix that when you multiply them together has the same shape of the original weight W like matrix but has a lot of less entries in this sense you really save memory space. Um, so that's another very popular technique. And then you can sort of extend on LoRa, use a quantized LoRa technique. So um, using LoRa on quantized models to do that. Um, so these are just some of the sort of quick highlights of uh, well-known uh, parameter efficient fine tuning techniques. There's many, many out there and we are very, very excited to actually see new techniques. Once we have the model fit into a mach machine, we know how to like fine tune it. Uh, we actually have to curate the data. Um, so I think Derek talked a little bit, like uh, touched a little bit about uh, what it means to curate data. Um, you can simply put a, a data set, you know, two plus three equal to five uh, as input into your LLM. But that probably not going to go very far unless all you want to do is just repeat two plus three equal to five. So instruction tuning is trying to come up with instruction set for specific data. So instead of trans like this sentence is translated into this sentence in Spanish, but the instructions really translated this to Spanish. And uh, same thing that uh, for a question and answer or truthful thing is based on the presented facts. Thus, this is support that's the, can you draw this conclusion is this true or false um, and then we talked uh, like uh, um, uh, I um, Derek already talked a bit about uh, using what we call the human in the loop reinforcement learning both use human labelers to generate uh, original instruction set and then using human labelers to build a scoring like uh, model uh, to generate data to build a scoring model so they use that as a critic or a teacher to help the um, uh, to help the thing learn. And of course, uh, you can also do all of that uh, with another language, language model. And uh, this is uh, what uh, uh, is very popular today called uh, self-instruction. And then if you hear about worker style uh, data set, uh, that's actually generated uh, using uh, chat GPT as one of that. Um, for and um, for this competition, we are not allow any like uh, LLM or like self-instructed data set. Um, and uh, Mark and I are happy to answer questions why not uh, in the Q&A section. So um, I talked a bit about uh, all the component uh, that uh, makes up uh, to this competition. And uh, we actually don't know what the winning entry will look like. Uh, we think that it will take a unique blend of quantization, uh, model efficient uh, trainings, data curation, along with some really creative training regime. And uh, we are really, really like uh, curious to find out uh, what will actually win. So with that, uh, maybe Mark, would you like to unmute and uh, uh, see if we have any questions uh, from the audience. Uh, um, sure, sure thing, yeah. So I think the first thing is I, I shared in the chat now like a link to our Discord group. 
So, you know, please, please join it. I think at this point we have like about like 500 different people uh, sharing like different tricks that they're using for fine tuning. It's, I think it's going to be a really valuable resource, especially that um, we we actually also have been collaborating with the Lightning team on having a Discord bot that can help you do like eval. So this should be out like sometime like very soon, like this week or next. Um, so it's going to be like an invaluable resource for, for for you to just like learn about fine tuning. And if you've never done it before, like like I think a competition is is like sort of like a great excuse to do it. Um, I I sort of want to like. You know, I echo really what what Weiwei was saying, which is like there's sort of like obviously like the different classes of techniques which we suspect will work. Uh... Oh, uh, can can uh, people hear me? Uh... Oh, I see. Okay. Um, yeah. So 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 there's obviously like different classes of techniques that will be like probably very helpful, right? So things like like LoRa style, like quantization, you know, maybe you have like a faster runtime, like Llama CPP style, and you can go through more iterations of like larger data sets, like faster than everyone. But I really want people, you know, to, to be thinking out of the box, but like, like, for, like we're, we're sort of like anchoring on techniques that became like very popular, like, especially like earlier this year, but we really, really hope that like the winner would either have like figured out how to perfect or really optimize like a composition of these techniques or come up like with some uh, like, like uniquely good ones, like new ones. Um, so Discord is also sort of like a great resource if you want to learn more about like some of the nuances behind our rules. So we, we, we basically, you know, like our, our philosophy is we sort of explain like our reasoning behind like the rules like in the open. So like we have like an argument, we discuss like back and forth with the community, like, like around what would make the competition more interesting. Um, and specifically, like, I think uh, like one, one rule I want to talk about is sort of like, you know, restrictions around uh, like base models and like data sets. Cause like this sort of, you know, accidentally now, like a lot of ML engineers have to be like, you know, licensed lawyers uh, because of like the way the space is evolving. So I just want to give people like a quick TLDR of, uh, of, of, of sort of the important parts here. So let's say like uh, chat GPT, like the terms of services do not allow you to like collect the data set from it and like fine tune with it. So some people might still do it, but it makes it very difficult to have sort of like an officially backed competition, where like such a regime might work. Even then, let's say OpenAI was like more permissive with their license. So you, you run into this problem of, well, it's not a research artifact. Like this is a model that changes over time. And so this sort of like hampers reproducibility from our competition, which we believe is sort of like one of the key things of making this like actually useful. Um, the other thing is like on, on like restricting data sets, like the motivation for that is really um, sort of similar to the licensing thing, like where there's sort of like a lot of data sets where it's like very ambiguous, whether they were actually generated by like some like closed source or not. And there's others that have been very clear about their data provenance that have done like data contamination studies that did like new algorithmic like generations. And so those are the kinds of things like will allow and will likely not like net you into trouble. But again, like if, if there's sort of anything unclear uh, you know, please ask us on Discord. Like, this is why we're here. I have a couple of questions uh, from the audience. Mm -hmm. uh, so mm -hmm. there is one that is very specific and is a question about the FLAN collection listed among the allowed data sets. And the question is whether that might contain some LLM generated text. Uh, is it like, if it's listed, that means it's allowed or should people like still think about and, and, and double check like this, um, synthetic data sets. Um, so like like at least like when I last checked the paper, I didn't get the impression that there was anything that was like um generated in there. Uh, like like that said, if if the person asking the question has like sort of a specific snippet they want to refer to from the paper, you know, we'd be happy to take a look at it on the Discord group and, and clarify the rules. Thank you. There's another question that might not necessarily speak to the challenge, uh, but I, I I still want to to ask it. So the question is whether there is a general resource on choosing hardware for MLDL LLM model. I think it's it's probably it's, it's definitely like an area of research. So I don't think you can give a, a definitive answer here, but you have made a choice of like specific like two GPUs. So if you can you can give us a bit more motivation behind this choice, that would be helpful. 
Um, wait, wait, do you, do you want to cover well, that? Or I, I, I think have, I that uh, we are choosing the two type of GPUs partially is uh, motivated by what's available and uh, we want uh, to allow both commodity, uh, so that's uh, what's represented by 4090 and uh, some uh, slightly high end, uh, that's uh, A100. Uh, um, Mark, if you want to add to that? Um, sure, yeah, like, I, I think conceptually, we wanted, like, if you look at the price of like a brand new 4090, it's like about $1,600, $600, right? And if you can get like something that's like used, like you might find something like even a bit cheaper. And it also has like a dual use, so like, you can use it to play video games if you're not like training models. And so we, we wanted to have something that felt like plausible, like for like a regular person to buy. And, you know, I know thousand six hundred dollars can still be pricey but it's like still like half of what like let's say like a new like macbook cost so it sort of felt like sort of like a reasonable thing and it's something valuable for people to own um you know whereas like with the a100 track like you know our reasoning there was hey like yes like you know why not anchor this on a k80 because that's what google collab has or like a t4 uh you know like why not a v100 like like why was it Right. And I think the reason why A100 is because like that's where we're seeing like most of the enterprise interest be because like A100s have like tensor cores available and they're like wicked fast. They're not always like available. Uh, you know, you sometimes have to fight for them on cloud providers, but it's like a lot better than H100s. And so because like this is sort of like a hardware architecture that we see significant enterprise interest in, it felt sort of like the right the, the right way for the more enterprisey uh, track of the competition, the right hardware to pick. Um, awesome. There, there is another question that I, I think um, I, I can answer. So the question is whether we will be building something ourselves uh, or yourself as the audience as part of this course. And uh, our recommendation is actually for you to participate in this challenge, even if you're not planning to win it and you don't may have time constraints. I think this sets like a, a good constraint. It gives you like a good evaluation metric. You can exchange experiences with other participants of this challenge. So our recommendation is that you do participate. But if you prefer to, to opt out of this challenge, like we still encourage you to fine tune an LLM. Um, and that's that because that's the topic of this course and you only learn by doing it. And if you have a specific task, like a personal project that you want to build, uh, that's that's fine as well for, for the participation in this course. But um, my personal experience with this type of challenges, if you participate, you learn much more than, uh, than by opting out. Um, um, there I, is a question. Yeah. Go ahead, I, I, I actually want to comment on this because this is interesting. Like, basically, like the, the the Discord group is sort of like a peer group of people that are collectively learning how to fine tune, and like the organizers themselves, like like my like myself and, and Weiwei included, are extremely interested in like what kinds of tricks like people will will do. So like we're sort of taking like almost like a peer review style of like figuring out like what what works. Add to that like a, like a real world like like Discord eval bot. Like I think this could be um quite compelling and again like you know you, you you can you can learn a lot about the competition you know we we always encourage you to submit we realize like sometimes like just starting out might be like a bit overwhelming which is why we have a really nice like starter kit that like is based off of list gpt which should give you a good baseline so if you just start with that and like you know tweak like 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 hack together a few things like change a couple lines you might still like learn a lot. And then if you feel like you want sort of like, like, like if you feel sort of this is not, not, not the right approach and you have like some like more significant ideas you'd like to contribute, like, of course, like, I mean, the way our submission infra will work, it's like sort of a very general HTTP service. So you can do whatever you want, but you know, we really want to make sure that uh, you have a smooth experience to ship that first line of code that will make you feel productive. So if that doesn't feel like the case, please join Discord and, and complain. There is another question uh, whether we'll be talking about fine tuning multimodal LLMs in this course. Uh, I think uh, this is uh, this is definitely not the scope of this uh, uh, efficiency challenge. Uh, I don't think you're evaluating on any multimodal data, uh, Mark and Wei Wei. And I don't. Maybe I next think year. This, okay. Yeah, I think this may be a, a bit out of um, out of scope for this course. But I do believe that um, the skills that you will gain uh, will also transfer into multimodal. That's my my personal belief. Um, 
All right, there's, um, let me just ask a final question and we'll hand over to Ayush. So there is a question whether we'll talk about how to fine tune on raw or unstructured or unlabeled data without creating question and, and response parts. I, I interpret that as, as a kind of domain adaptation, like extending kind of pre-training. I'm not sure if in the course we'll focus specifically on that, but I think like the fine tuning techniques that we'll use with instruction data sets might just as well be applicable with this like further pre-training. Any thoughts, uh, Mark, uh, well, or way on uh, domain adaptation? Well, it's definitely one of uh, the standing challenge uh, of machine learning. And uh, I think uh, in general, um, there's a very uh, few performance guarantee you can get uh, overall, but uh, it all depends on the task and uh, the specific uh, data that you're trying to adapt. Uh, and uh, part of like, uh, I guess, uh, in the spirit of getting hands uh, on experience, it's uh, all about just trying and see what you can get out of it. Awesome. Wait, wait, Mark, uh, we really appreciate you coming into this, um, into this event uh, and, and sharing and, and also preparing this challenge. We, we feel like this is making LLMs more accessible to a broader range of people. So uh, that's uh, definitely a good thing. We really appreciate it. And in this next part, uh, we also want to, want to make it even more accessible. So Ayush Thakur uh, has uh, prepared like also our own version of the starter kit which uh, also includes some uh, really cool experiment tracking. So I use over to you to present uh, and give people some uh, hands-on tips on how to get started with this challenge. Uh, thanks, Derek, uh, for the introduction. And also thank you, Mark and Vivi, for that wonderful talk. It was really enlightening. And we learned a lot about how to do, like about this challenge and why they, thought about this challenge, what are the GPU constraints, what are, what's evaluation and everything. So today I will be presenting, and let me share my screen and I hope that the whole screen will, I mean, I will be able to share the whole thing with all of you. Hmm, just give me a sec. Uh, yeah, I have shared my screen. I'm not sure if it's visible on YouTube, but uh, yeah, thanks for the introduction, Mark and Vivi, once again. And uh, today I will basically be giving some practical tips and will be sharing the starter file that I've been working for over a week now on uh, how to fine tune LLMs with GPU constraints. And the focus will be a uh, seven billion seven billion LLM model. Right. So before I go into the code. Let me basically just give the big picture in here, right? So the big picture is you need to use an open source data. It can be a Dolly 15K, it can be OASST1, which is an open system database. You can use any other open source database for that matter to fine tune a language model, right? Then you can again come up with any fine tuning repository or any script for that matter, you can build your own uh, fine tuning repository if you wanna in the course of this competition. And with the data and some tri tri uh, fine tuning code, what we are gonna do is pick a base pre-trained LLM. It can be a Llama 2, it can be a Falcon, Open Llama. It can even be BERT or T5, it's up to you. And I mean, the competition host they have listed down the allowed models that we can pick. So yeah, as, as they mentioned, we can do the encoder, decoder, or both encoders with decoder style model. So with all of these, what we need to do is fine tune on a single A100 with 40 GB of uh, GPU memory or a 4090 uh, GPU. And once we have the, pre the fine tune model, the competition, uh, hosts are going to be evaluating that model against a subset of Helm benchmark. And they also have some holdout secret tasks that they have not shared uh, that they might be using to do like the final phase of evaluation. Right. So this is the big picture. 
And uh, having said that, there are so many stages and there are so many things to think about the data that you want to curate, how you want to curate, how you want to sample, with the strategies for fine tuning the model, but you also need to be really careful about how you're going to evaluate it, evaluate the model. It's not like a typical Kaggle competition wherein the evaluation data is fixed and also evaluation metric is fixed. Here, the evaluation is something that you need to think about. Right, just, uh, I will just walk, give like some two cents on the data pipeline and the fine tuning pipeline. So on the data side, whatever pipeline you have, make sure that it's kind of easy to play with it's hackable so that you can download whatever data you want to download also it has convenient scripts to convert the data into usable formats you can mix different open source data sets and also sample from them depending on i mean the evaluation metric that you want to improve so all of these should be considered while you're thinking about a data pipeline also the data loader should be available both for the training and the evaluation right and on the script side of the repository side for fine tuning, uh, it should have some convenient uh, functionalities to load any model, to checkpoint, to train a model, in this case, fine tune the model on the data set that you have curated. But given it's a research project, the scripts, whatever uh, pipeline you use, whatever repository you use, make sure that it's easy to hack on, it's easy to add in new features, it's easy to try out new functionalities. Right. And to be honest, there's like a whole host of options out there. It's just up to you to pick Google our stuff, uh, see what works best for your happy with it. Having said that, uh, I have spent like a few weeks now to curate this repos this repository. So if you go to this link, wendb.me slash neorips dash LLM dash fine tuner or scan this QR code, you will head to this repository. Uh, which is New Lips LLM Efficiency Challenge. And uh, I just want to give a quick uh, rundown of what this, what you can expect in this repository. Uh, yeah, so the rundown is basically that this repository is built on top of LegGPT. So the official starter kit that was provided by the organizers, that was also built on top of LegGPT. But the focus for that repository was mostly to showcase submission because submission is tricky here. I will cover, try to cover that if we have time. Uh, so it's built on LegGPT, but I'm not you. I'm using a fork of LegGPT so that I can add in some functionalities. I can hack uh, with the original code base and add in some stuffs. In this case, I've instrumented uh, the LegGPT. The, the fork with weights and biases, experiment tracking, and I'm working on more functionalities like check, checkpointing. So if you have a LoRa fine-tuned model, you just provide in the URL for the weights from the weights and biases run, and can then pull the model and yeah, do all the evaluation and stuff for you automatically. So I'm just trying to build those things. Uh, having said that, I've also documented all the steps that's required uh, to set up your system. Uh, and to be honest, it took some time for me especially because it was me doing it for the first time. And I assume that a lot of folks who will be participating in this call, in this competition, they will be doing it for the first time as well. So instead of, instead of spending a lot of time, you can maybe just uh, go through the steps that, I've, that I have documented in the readme. Uh, right, and with this repository, I mean, especially with LegGPT, you have strategies like LoRa fine tuning, QLoRa, like, adapter, adapter V2, and some convenient scripts for downloading the model, preparing the data, et cetera, out of the, off the shelf. Yeah, so if you can see the repository in here, uh, as I mentioned, every step has been documented and it's like, you need to create some environment, you need to install some packages. Uh, I have also covered some of the gotchas that you might encounter if you are installing flash attention and if you're like, yeah, if you have to deal with CUDA. So in case, if you need to update the CUDA version to 11.4 of their steps that I have documented that you can just use and it will work. And these are the steps to basically download flash attention. So why flash attention? It will basically help fine tuning bigger models because it helps with the uh, with the memory usage of the model when it's loaded for uh, for training, um, yeah, and and yeah, there are some useful tips on on what parameters should be used for max job and those stuffs which you can find in here. 
and yeah, it will just simplify your life and can get started. Also, uh, if because this whole repository is built on top of LegPT, we have convenient scripts to download the, the model with. So in this case, I'm downloading the Llama 2, 7 billion uh, uh, para model, and yeah, LegPT requires it to be converted to a standard format so that the training loop can consume the standard model format and yeah, just use it. And it also have some convenient fun, uh, feature uh, scripts to download the data set and prepare it. In this case, I'm using a Dolly 15K, but yeah, feel free to use Red Pajama data, one trailer or like, yeah, use your own data, write some script and yeah, you can start playing with that and uh, for the pipe with the pipeline. Great, so we have some steps to set up the whole thing. Maybe have to that, take care of CUDA, install flash tension, uh, download the data, download the model, etc. A quick note on the model, for if you want to fine tune a Llama 2, you need to get permission from the authors of Llama 2. And if you go to the model card, uh, the hugging face model card for Llama 2, it just, just need to provide your email ID and click a button and yeah, just wait for a few days, one or two days, most probably, and you would have access to it. So yeah, it's like very easy. Great. Now with one line of code, uh, we can start fine tuning the model. Just to walk through, it's a lot of, fine tuning strategy that I'm using. I have provided the data directory. Uh, I have provided the checkpoint, in this case, a Llama 2 7 billion model. And yeah, it's used. I've specified the precision for fine tuning to be brain floor 16. Uh, there are other precisions that you can try out, maybe brain floor 16 mix. And depending on the precision, uh, you might get different uh, accuracy, different like improvement to the metric or the metric might even go down, the evaluation metric might go down. So you need to experiment. Also, depending on the precision, uh, the diff the memory requirement will be changing. So a true brain float 16 will consume less memory compared to a brain float 16 mix, just as an example. And recently, they added uh, QLORA, which is a quantized LORA fine tuning strategy, which is also great. And they are continuous, the LegPT team is continuously working on making things simpler for you. And in turn, this my repository in this case is gonna be yeah, consuming those features as well. And I will be adding some functionalities on my own, especially on the MLOps side of things. Great, so just focusing on the fine tuning, what I did was I fine tuned two models, one a Falcon 7 billion model and a Llama 2 7 billion model. So as you can see, since I was logging everything to weights and biases, you can look through the throughputs, the flops, uh, other metrics that's been generated in the script and been locked to 1DB. Uh, the most ex exciting thing while fine tuning is the loss curve. As you can see, the Llama 2 has a better loss compared to a Falcon 7B model. And just to give important information here, which is both the models were trained on the same data with the same configuration for the same number of steps. So, uh, so Llama 2 seems to be performing good on the training data set at least. Great, now let's try to look at one run. So let's look at the fine tuning of fine tuning of Llama 2. So as I showed, we have the metrics been logged, the loss and everything, but what else has been captured automatically for you? So in this comp challenge, uh the one of the goal is that you only need or one of the constraints is that you only can train a model for one g uh, for one day right so use one gpu and train it for one day so it's important to track the amount of time that was spent on training the model and in this case i just spent like three hours and 43 minutes i could have trained longer because i have that budget to go till 24 hours great I can also look at the command that was used to train the model, which is also a good thing because you might be trying out so many things and you need to keep track of what command created that particular metric. Uh, talking about uh, keeping track of things that will directly correlate with the metrics that you are getting, you need to keep track of the configuration. So in this case, I was using a batch size of 128, but the micro batch size, uh, because I was using grad, accu grad accumulation was just one and it was trained for 20K iterations with a LoRa rank of four. And if you can see here, uh, I turned the LoRa key, the LoRa 
uh, query and load of value. So the key query and value, these three parameters or these three weight matrices in a transformer block were being fine tuned. And because of that, uh, the number of trainable parameters were only one, like three million in this case. So the original model size is seven billion uh, or close to seven billion, but the number of trainable parameters for this fine tuning job is only three million, which is great, but still it's a lot of, it's, it's a huge model and, and you have to come up with techniques and strategies to uh, fit this in a model and train it efficiently. Great, we, we have configurations, we have the time, track, everything, great. Now look at the system metrics because you have just one GPU for one day and you need to put in as much data as possible so that the model can see as much data. The more data the model can see in a single day, the better it is. So since system metrics is tracked automatically with RunDB, we can look at the memory allocated. So like 23-ish percent of the memory was allocated for this job while the utilization is not so great. So maybe there's a bug in that uh, bug in my pipeline that just might be a bug in the LoRa.py script. I'm not sure is it, it might be something uh, uh, in the way I train the model, but you can see that with time the utilization dropped and ideally we want the utilization to be close to 100% or like above 90% at, like ideally, because if it's cranking in numbers, uh, or utilizing the GPU better, you might be able to push in, shove in more data, uh, in turn improve the metric of the model. Great, so that's metric. Yeah, I mean, you can also look at the, the exact script that was used in this case, the LoRa. You can also track in the code file. Great, so that's one run that I, I just ran this one single line of code, which is LoRa.py. And all of this information were tried automatically because I instrumented the code with RunDB. If you are using a different uh, fine tuning script or different repository, you might find RunDB out of the box. If not, you can just uh, instrument it yourself. It's very easy. Great. So that's on uh, uh, fine tuning. Now let's go and think about evaluation a bit. So, it's like just two cents sharing here. And this is something that's inspired by an idea that was shared by Sebastian Raksha in a PyTorch Lightning blog post that he wrote about this competition. So he said that since the evaluation, the final evaluation will be done on a subset of Helm, how about we pick some other benchmark, open benchmark like Eluthers, LM, Eval Hardness, or maybe Google's Big Bench. And the point is that with, for example, LM eval harness, there's a overlap with the Helm benchmark. So you can maybe take a subset of LM eval, consider that as a validation set, evaluate your model on that, and use the Hel like a subset of Helm as a test set and see if uh, the validation is improving and your test is, is improving as well. If the so both are improving that your model might be generalizing better. So you can come up with good strategies about evaluation. Uh, so it's up to you to experiment with different subsets of the, these benchmarks because for example, LM eval harness has 200 tasks. So you can pick a small, smaller subset or subsets that might actually have a better chance in getting a better score on the leaderboard. So, so how to go about setting up evaluation now? I have also documented all of these things here uh, that you can go through. So setting up evaluation with Eluter LM eval harness, which is straightforward, just clone the repository and pip install it. Uh, I'm also documented. I mean, this is something that I have basically picked from uh, the sample uh, submission starter kit that was that was provided by the organizers. But uh, I took the liberty of trying it out myself and like documenting what was required and like with some more comments that I have, that I felt would might, would, would might be helpful for all of you. And similarly, I tried using the Helm benchmark, installing the whole thing. And it was also well documented in the starter kit. But again, I took the liberty of trying it myself and like documenting everything for all of you. And yeah, I also encountered some issues and yeah, like provided some links that you can maybe try and fix that issues. So 
that's like you setting up the pipeline and evaluating because I was able to do so. Uh, we'll just quickly share some interesting evaluation that I was able to do. So I will start with uh, the evaluation on uh, Falcon 7B. So it's the base Falcon 7B. And you can see the numbers here. Just to give some insight, I used four uh, tasks, the wiki test, the arithmetic IDC, the truthful QA MC, and the open book QA. So these were the four tasks or a subset of tasks from the LM eval harness benchmark. So how is Llama 2 compared uh, on this exact benchmark? Let's see. So as you can see, the perplexity of Llama 2 base model uh, is better than Falcon B. So the lesser of perplexity, the better the model is. So it's better. You can see that Llama 2 is also better on arithmetic task. It's slightly better on the truthful QA and open book QA as well. So on open book is kind of hard to say which model is better. So they are kind of same. Great. So that's the base model that we compare. So with just this, we can say that maybe picking Llama 2 as the initial checkpoint would make a lot of sense. But again, it's subject to a lot of experimentation, it's subject to uh, your evaluation strategy and also will depend on the final evaluation that the fine-tune model will be done on. So that's the base model. But what is more exciting is after fine-tuning the two models, uh, with the same configuration, same hyperparameters, what's the result? So let me close the base model here. And we can totally see that after fine tuning, um, yeah, the, the Llama 2 is performing again better compared to a Falcon B. And if you just look them, like compare them from the baseline, we can totally see that uh, after fine tuning, uh, we can, um, after fine tuning, the perplexity actually got bad for uh, Falcon. Uh, also, if you look at the arithmetic for both Falcon and both Llama, the on the arithmetic benchmark, we got zero accuracy. And this might be because Dolly 15K is not actually catered towards like arithmetic based uh, question answering, which brings to the point that you really need to bring in other data like data sets and like mix and match and sample data sets and curate your data set for like improving the overall accuracy, overall metrics, not just accuracy. And yeah, like you can log everything to RenDB and look at the dashboard like this and compare results, which is a great way of, uh, yeah, finding insights from the research that you are doing, uh, f finding if whatever research and whatever strategies that you are doing is working out or not. So that was evaluation. Uh, I will take a pause right now because uh, this is what I had to cover. Again, I will really love you all to check out this repository that's linked in here. And yeah, try it out. If there's any step that might, might be misdocumented or if it's not working for you, feel free to open an issue. Raise a PR if you want. And yeah, I would love to uh, take it from there. So that's it. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Ayush. Uh, really appreciate this uh, this hands-on um, um, starter package that hopefully can uh, can make it easier to get started in this competition. Um, Mark, uh, wait, wait. Any any comments from you? Like we actually get uh, got one question that is a very technical question, specifically related to flash attention too. We might get into this topic in lesson four when Jonathan Frankel will be talking about uh, training and fine tuning techniques. But I think in the meantime, we might, we might want to encourage people to ask this question on the competition discord where probably you might have the right audience to discuss this type of topics. Uh, yeah, I, I guess I had a question. Like, you should please, please submit this as well. Like, I think it would be very valuable if people could like learn how to quickly get like dashboards ready for them. I think that'd be very valuable. So please send us a PR yeah. and be happy to merge it. For sure, for sure. Awesome. Let me uh, do a quick check if there are any uh, f outstanding questions. I don't see anything in the chat, but we'll we'll wait for. Um, a minute or two, just in case uh, questions are coming. We might have a bit of a delay uh, between the live stream and this um, 
and this uh, this um, recording here. Okay, I don't see any questions. Again, a uh, big thanks to, uh, to Weiwei uh, and Mark uh, for uh, presenting and, and hosting and organizing this challenge. Uh, thank you, Ayush, uh, for uh, working on this on the starter package and, and showing people how they uh, how they can uh, fine tune the model, uh, how they can uh, submit into into this competition, and also track their experiments with weights and biases. Next week, uh, we will talk more in depth about evaluation and understanding evaluation, different metrics, different benchmarks will definitely be important as you try to fine tune uh, a model and, and make it work really, really well. And then we'll take uh, a break for a couple of weeks and then we'll come back with uh, one of the top experts in this field, Jonathan Frankel, to talk about uh, different data sets for uh, training and fine tuning language models and uh, training and fine tuning techniques. Uh, thanks everyone for joining. Uh, we appreciate you uh, being here with us. Uh, we encourage you to get started on this competition, fine tune your LLMs efficiently on a Bye. single Thanks GPU, hopefully to keep the cost low, and um, and join uh, both the competition Discord. We also have weights and biases Discord for folks that uh, that want to to ask questions specific to weights and biases. And uh, we're looking forward to to chatting with you next week. Thank you so much for having us.